glad you're still watching Prime Morning. And of course, it is a Wednesday. And anytime it's a Wednesday, you know we bring you the big conversation, talking about the big interview. And our guest that sits down tells us how the journey always started. And they tell us how it's going. For those of you at home, you do admire such people that we sit them down because you want to be like them one day. But the journey is never easy. But they will tell you how they were able to overcome the obstacles and get to where they are today. I'm starting my year well. And I posted it and I said to the world, starting this year with a great man like this makes me know that my 2023 will be fantastic. And for you watching the show this morning, obviously you have a fantastic 2023 as well. My guest is a man that I admire so much, a man of God that I revere as well. I might not be a member of his church. For some people, they admire him too, although they are not members of his church. Yesterday when I posted it, People came on my page telling me how they admire him, how they love him, how they, he's been there for them. And for them, he's a father that they always ask God for. His name is Reverend Steve Wingham. Now, this man is also the general overseer for Cedar Mountain Chapel. And... You were saying you have so many titles, Reverend. <laughs> I mean, talking about your titles, the accomplished, you're also the general superintendent for the Assemblies of God, Ghana. You are a father of many. Welcome, Reverend. Well, for Cedar Mountain Chapel, East Legon Assemblies of God, I'm the lead pastor. Lead pastor. Thank okay. <laughs> All right. Now, welcome. Thank you very much for having me on your great show. And thank you for being here. We must say it's, it hasn't been easy trying to get you here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of uh, assignments, but um, this is uh, a huge platform. You reach many people. Mm. So we have to avail ourselves to be a blessing. We are super grateful. Thank you. I saw your name on social media and I said, Yenusum. Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah, Yenusum. Yenusum. And so people wonder, Yenusum, where do you hail from? Yeah, I hail from the northeastern region of Ghana, um, specifically Pagmatig in the Bumprugu um, Nakonduri district of Ghana. It's a very small area. Um, my tribe is Bimoba, a very small tribe. That's the language, and again, the name of the language is Moor. So I'm 100% Bimoba from northeastern region of Ghana. So Yenusso means God's help. As if my parents knew, um, my parents gave birth to four children. I'm the first. All my siblings are late. They passed. I'm the only surviving. Um, I was a child of my parents. So the name Yenuso means God's help. And indeed, that name has been impactful. The Lord has been my great helper. Mm. Then you will say that names are very impactful in the very, life. Very, very influential. You don't joke with names. Mm. Names are spirits. Um, if you look at God himself, when God created um, everything, he mandated Adam to give names and Adam was intentional and whatever name, sorry, you give to anything, you become that thing. Mm. So a clear example in the Bible is um, Naboth, no, um, it's um, Abigail's husband, um, whom Ab Abigail told David, you know, his name means fool. And indeed, he has behaved foolishly. Mm. Another person in the Bible is, um, um, oh, come on. <laughs> he also went to God. And um, the Bible says that um, he had a glorious destiny. I mean, the name will come. I can't mm, definitely. believe. Mm. Yes. He had a is glorious. It no, uh, okay. Jabez. Jabez, okay. Jabez. And uh, so names are very important. Mm. And I want to advise anybody. Make sure that the name you choose represents your aspiration, uh, represent what you want to become, because you become what name is placed on you. Can you change your name if you don't like the name that your parents gave to you? Then, um, two, yeah, you, you, two things: you can or you can still maintain the name, but deal with the spirit behind the name. Mm. Jabez did not change his name. He went to God and said, "God, um, um, touch my destiny." Um, turn things around, remove the limitation that my name places on me. And God answered him. If it's a same name, you, you can do a little about it. I mean, that is the name that identifies you with a family. Mm -hmm. So I would say that if, if the name given to you connotes something negative, just go to God in prayer, spend some time fast and pray, deal with the spirit behind that name, and then move on with your life. Right.
Now let's talk about growing up. I mean, losing three of your siblings and you becoming the only surviving one. How was life like? Life was a bit lonely. Um, I remember those days, we used to live in a compound house when it's rainy. You know, kids love it when it's rainy. Mm -hmm. And now here, our neighbors, the room there, they are jumping, um, shouting and playing. And I'm there alone with my father and mom. It was quite lonely. Many times I would tell my mother, wouldn't you give birth? I want, I want siblings. Um, um, three of them, they all died. The, 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 um, the last born died at age, around age one. The rest, three months. The other, the other two, three months, six months. Wow. Yeah, so my parents really uh, went through a lot. My mom, had, my mom had to do four surgeries for three, three of us. She had to undergo surgery for delivery. Um, so it was, it was pretty tough, mm -hmm. but uh, God was gracious to us. I know you were quite young. You were like six years, right, before they passed? Um, I think about three. About three years? Yeah, about three Did years. you ever ask your parents what caused the death? Of your no, interestingly, no. Um, I don't know why I didn't ask that, but um, I didn't ask. Mm. <laughs> and this happened in Accra. Were you were you born in Accra? Yeah, I was born in Accra. Mm. I'm a Tema boy. Okay. I, I grew up in Tema, <laughs> and then around um, in the early eighties, we, we we relocated to Nungua. Uh, went to accommodation problems and went back in 85. Okay. Yes, I was, I was born and bred in Accra. With the leadership qualities as well? Um, I presume so. <laughs> uh, because I remember when growing up, anywhere I found myself among my peers, I would gather my peers and then begin to say, let's do this, let's do that. Especially, I would say, I will gather them and say, let's have church service. And right from age five, six, and then all through my life, anywhere I found myself, I found myself in leadership. Mm. Um, school, even though class preferred, uh, school preferred, or one leadership role or the other, it's been so mm. from the beginning. So you were never a bad boy. It's like you've known uh, God since your childhood, huh? Yes, I was born into a Christian family. My parents, um, Assemblies of God, right from the word go, they did, they did well, so I had a solid Christian foundation. The only time I, was, I, I, I became a bad boy, I did something naughty, mm. was um, I think peer pressure. I had just um, I gained admission to Tema Secondary School, mm -hmm. now Tema Senior High School, and I was in the Scripture Union. I was the, um, in Form 2, I was made the SU librarian. Then my friend, the sister, had just um, um, gained admission Form 1, that new boyfriend, girlfriend, this thing, we all had it. We just wanted to try it. Mm -hmm. So I remember writing a love letter. In those days, <laughs> the brightness of this day has given me the, the opportunity <laughs> to write you this letter. <laughs> I suspect you. <laughs> so I wrote a letter to this girl. She accepted it. Uh -huh. Then within 24 hours, after SU meeting, I was told that the SU executive wanted to meet me. I was wondering what was it. I entered the room and there was this seat in the middle. None of them were sitting the round table kind of seating. Right. And then they asked me, um, uh, Stephen, um, do you have a girlfriend? Of course, do you expect me to say yes? Of it's course. natural. Exactly. I denied it. <laughs> Are you sure? Then they pulled out the letter. I've never <laughs> felt embarrassed and ashamed in my life like that day. Oh. So I broke down. I said, I'm sorry. I always say that God loves me. Mm. God, maybe God's call upon my life. I mean, God will not just allow me to go beyond that point. Less than 24 hours. I had just written a letter. She said yes. I don't know why she went to report me. She went and reported <laughs> me, and that ended it. And since then... So that's your level of bad boy? That was the furthest I went to. I never... In fact, the only relationship I entered was with my wife. I married a virgin. I mean, it's been so. <laughs> Apart from stealing meat from the soup. <laughs> uh, so no clubbing, no, no alcohol, no, nothing. nothing. I've never tasted alcohol before. Nothing, no. It's been church boy, SU boy, till I, I was wow. called, called into the ministry. Yeah. Will you say you were called into the ministry or you were handpicked by God? Because it looks like, you know, growing up, you knew that you were going to be a pastor one day. Yeah, I knew it. Um, the, 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 the desire to be a pastor was so strong. 
to the extent that in, a, in the compound house where we live, I always gather the children and I say, I am Reverend Amponsa. My childhood pastor was called Reverend Amponsa. Okay. And I'll mimic him. I'll mimic pastors. Even up to secondary school, from one, I remember we live on a story building. Every Sunday morning, I'll move to the top. We have this um, uh, uh, space there. And then I will assume I'm preaching to thousands of people and I'll be mimicking my pastor. So I, I knew I for the calling and those, my parents tell me that when at my christening, mm. the pastor who christened me, the late Reverend J.C. Tet of Blessed Memory, in the prayer, they could tell I'll be a pastor. Right. So I always tell parents in my church, when you bring your child to the church for christening, pay attention to the prayer. Pay attention to the comments of the man of God. Mm. You could glean the direction your child will go in the near future. Wow. Quite interesting to know this uh, because most people actually start a journey to do so many things before God calls them. But everybody's path is different. Yeah. Everybody's path is different. Yeah. So you being married to your wife, she's the only woman you've known, like you said. Yeah, only woman. The only woman. 21 years has been. 22. 22. Wow, congratulations. 14 years, no child. We had our first child after 14 years of marriage. We have two kids now. I throw a yellow penny. Um, Wengam, she's eight, and Matthew King, Ban and Wengam, he's six. Tell us how it was. 14 years, serving yeah. God, no child. Praying for others, and they were giving birth, having children, christening them. Um, yeah, it was not easy. I mean, I was wondering, I thought that if um, my parents endured this, and now I've been a church boy, never clapped, never did anything bad, you know, so you wonder, but I think my Christian foundation, Assemblies of God, helped. If you know Assemblies of God, we are sound doctrine-based church. Right. If you take your Christian life serious there, when you go through affliction, you will not be swayed. Mm -hmm. And you know, I had been the radio pastor for CTFM4 until I was elected, right. I had to step aside and on pray on air for people, 16 years of marriage, giving birth, you know, God has a way of testing our faith. Mm. God has a way of testing our faith. And the waiting was, was worth it. And if I'm to ever come back to life again and to live, I will, I will still opt the same for this years part. Oh, yes. It made my life and my wife and I bond very well. Mm. And um, we love each other so much. We learned a lot. We learned patience. God uses afflictions to teach us patience to improve your character. It's an opportunity to draw close to God. And I remember um, one day after my radio show, uh, a couple called me and said, Pastor Wingham, I was going to divorce my wife. I said, why? You married for five years, no child. When I heard your story, I realized I have no grounds. And I was like, wow, if my test and pain saved somebody's marriage, and I, I want it again and again. Mm. Life is not about um, um, the pleasures of this life. It's about impacting somebody. So if my pain um, gives somebody relief, that is what that is an important aspect of life. Quite interesting to hear again. But then the pain you went through. Mm. As you're talking, someone will think that because he's a pastor, I wasn't. You know, was just he knew God would do it one day, so he was okay. Were there moments that you cried? Oh, many times, many times, you know, especially, and God, God is amazing. Any time it began to have a toll on me, God will send somebody to come and give you an encouragement. Somebody you don't know, or somebody around you will quote a scripture, will, or God will show you a dream. And sometimes you will think the dream means it will happen tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah, that's how God deals with us. In fact, in the, um, in the scriptures, Paul said that don't be anxious about anything. He says, in, in all situations with prayer and supplication, make your request known to God and the peace of God will flood your heart. Now, peace in the scriptures is not what the dictionary defines as peace. The, 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 the dictionary defines peace as the absence of chaos and war. Mm. The Bible defines peace as the presence of Jesus in the midst of troubles and chaos. And his presence comes to give you an assurance that God is with me. An example is Mark 4, 35 to verse 40. 
Christ told the disciples to cross over to the other side. And then midway the journey, there was a huge storm. The wind was boisterous and their lives were in danger. The disciples began to throw things out of their boat. And with the Bible said the water entered the vessel, mm. meaning life is threatened. Shockingly, they then found that Jesus, Jesus was sleeping in the corner of the vessel and they were shocked. Water entered the vessel, the wind is boisterous, and yet Jesus is sleeping. That is peace. There was a contest where um, artists were asked to draw anything that illustrates peace. And you can imagine somebody would draw a beautiful, rich man's house with swimming pool. You know, Africa, because of poverty, <laughs> we think that one of the signs of um, peace, is, peace and riches is yeah. a nice house with swimming pool. Yeah. <laughs> And they do all kinds of things. Then one particular actor won the contest. Was he drew this uh, coconut tree by the seaside? The wind was blowing very hard, and the tree had bent over, and there was this little bird asleep on it. So, um, so back to the issue. Um, whilst we're going through this period of waiting, I don't call it barrenness or childlessness. It it's a period of waiting. Mm. Um, anytime we got to that point, God will send somebody to encourage us and till. And I commend my wife. Oh, she's a phenomenal woman. She's a woman of strong character. Mm. Um, some of the, them, I, you don't hear no women. Some yeah. of the comments, castigations, I don't get to hear them. Um, you others will give you attitude, even comment from colleague pastors. Can be terrible, oh yeah. But uh, we endured it. And Colleague pastors were pastors. Oh yeah. Comments? Oh yeah. Somebody who sound like I don't understand why a man of God cannot give birth. I don't understand why a Christian should go through this. I had to rebuke um, one guy when I was in scripture. When I was SU president, mm -hmm. he was uh, one of the boys in the SU who at the time didn't even know his bearings. He, he, we met one day. Those days, hey, Pastor Ben you know, our pastor, our church, we pray and. People give birth, so I, you have to wake up at this time and pray and come to our church. So one of the low moments of my life. So I said, you know what? You know why? Why God allowed me to go through? God doesn't trust you. He said, why do you say that? I said, you see, if you should go through what I've gone through, you either divorce your wife or go for another woman. Right. But because God trusts me, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the Bible says that no temptation that God allows to come your way is beyond you. Is because God has confidence that you are able to endure. Mm -hmm. So because God trusts my wife and I that if I take them through this, he will not divorce his wife. He will not go for you know, he will not go and give birth mm -hmm. somewhere. So God trusts him. And it hit him like thunderbolt. And that ended that um, conversation. I mean the conversation and those kind of comments that doesn't help. So because of what I went through, I always educate my congregants. I said never use somebody's pain to castigate the person mm. you have no idea what the person is going through and you don't have control over your future sometimes in church ladies who get married think that the single ladies they are nothing and they think they are better off yeah. and i tell them you see sometimes your husband is even shocked why he married you i tell the ladies oh yeah i say you have no idea you're something your husband wonders you see what grace that when grace is upon you grace covers anything mm -hmm. and 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 then grace makes you attractive and appealing and after marriage they realize that mm, oh mm, yeah mm. so never never but, but rev another thing is um that people will be wondering you know the time of wait did you visit the hospital to check if things were right or they were not right yeah the early days mm. no i remember my mother would, was telling me why don't you do i said come on so i said faith the first two years I said, we are praying, we are fasting. So from the second year, then I began to realize that, listen, spirituality does not preclude um, seeking medical attention. Mm. In um, Romans 4, the Bible says that Abraham faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, but then he still trusted God. You must separate facts from the truth. Right. The fact is the reality. The fact is that you have, you have, you have, let's say, five broads, so it may hinder childbirth. Mm -hmm. But the truth is God's word. What God's word says about your situation is the truth. 
So never accept the fact. So Dr. Sun said, I know people who are no womb, but gave birth. Yeah. So the fact is that she was wombless. Mm. But the truth is that the Bible says that God makes water flow in the barren land. God made Sarah give birth at, at a ripe old age. So yes, we are we are sought medical attention. We did all we could. But then still God work. said the time wasn't up. Wow. And the Bible says that Christ was born, including um, John the Baptist, at the appointed time. At the appointed time, God does it so beautifully. The feeling when you realized that you were pregnant. Oh, the arrival of our daughter. Oh, my goodness. You, I, I can't describe it. Mm. I can't describe it. The joy is inexplicable. I mean, the joy. Of, it's like a woman who has carried the pregnancy for nine months. Eventually, when the child drops, she forgets the labor pain. So it was, it was wonderful. And I could see that the years of waiting and prayer has affected our children. They are, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are blessed. Mm. Oh yes. I, so I keep telling people that during your time of waiting, invest prayer because no prayer is wasted. No, 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 no. You may think that God didn't answer. You see, when you pray, God gives any of these three answers. No, wait, and yes. yes. Each of them is an answer. No is an answer. But human beings think that it's only yes. So even though God may not give you what, what you think is yes, mm -hmm. every prayer offered is an investment. Mm. So I, I see our children mm -hmm. growing up so well. I could see that they are developing very fast. Right. Because the years of waiting and prayer was an investment into their prophetic destiny. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the pictures and they are beautiful, I must say. And then there was the arrival of your boy. Yeah. I named him after my late father. He was a great Christian. Mm -hmm. The late Matthew Combian Wengam. He rest in peace. You have a beautiful family. I know looking back right now, you say, oh God, oh God. <laughs> you did it. Yeah, he did it. He's an amazing God. Let's talk about church. Okay. Um, you know, being a man of God, how, how many years now have you been ordained? Um, well, in Assemblies of God, you start from what we call Exhorter. Okay. So I was given Exhorter 2004. Okay. Then you are ordained five years after. Our ordination is our highest rank. Mm. So we have Exhorter. After two years, you write exams and you examine. Then you become a licentiate. Three years later, you become ordained. Okay. Now, be proud to um, me be, be being uh, given exhorter. I was already in ministry. Uh, I, so I will say I began pastoring 1999. Wow. Yes, I began pastoring 1999. Oh, that's quite a long time. Yeah. Apart from the, you know, the waiting um, childbirth, let's talk about ministry. Any challenges in ministry? Um, challenges? Oh, yeah, for ministry, there are challenges. I mean, challenges are always there. The ch challenges like it's a it's a warfare zone, mm. and if you you lose guard, you are always under constant attack, even at my level now. So um, spiritual attack. Oh, spiritual attack, spiritual attacks. Because you are the forefront saving souls from hell. The devil is not happy. Mm. So that's one. So the challenge of maintaining, a, a, you know, consistent, effective prayer life. You know, if you, are, if you are not disciplined and not careful, you, your prayer life can drop. At my level, there's a number of hours I must pray a day to, to stay relevant at, at my level. How many hours? I tell people I should do three hours a day. And for a Christian, one hour minimum. Three hours non-stop? Yes, Prayers. because, yes, because uh, when Jesus Christ found himself at the Gethsemane, and then left the three disciples, went a distance of to go and pray. He came back and found them sleeping. What was his remark? He says, couldn't you pray for only one hour? Hmm. He says, pray that you don't fall into temptation. That's why Peter denied Jesus. He couldn't pray one hour. He was sleeping. Right. So most of the temptations we fall into is because of prayerlessness. Remember Jesus, when he went, at that point, prayed and said, Lord, let this car pass away from me. Bible says angels came and strengthened him. Mm. When you pray, angels come to strengthen you. 
so you're able to endure. So the 14 years I endured, it's because of prayer. Because Hebrews 4 says that, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that you may find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Mm. So when you go to God in prayer, you receive grace so that even your difficult moments, until the answer comes, God gives you the capacity, the, the, you know, the waiting capacity, that whilst waiting, you don't mess up. You are able to stay faithful and true until God comes through for you. Mm. You have a lot of members. How did you do it? Church growth is not man's doing. Mm. In the 1 Corinthians 3, the Apostle Paul says that um, one planted Apollos water and God gives the increase. So increase comes from God. Look, any pastor who tells you that uh, there's a strategy, yes, there are things you do that can enhance growth. Mm. But growth comes from God. And you also you want to be careful in equating success in ministry to numbers. Okay. Yes, numbers are good. Numbers in the sense that we more souls are being saved. Mm -hmm. Somebody may not have the numbers. It is faithfulness to the end. In the parable of the talent, he said, thou good and faithful servant. So the criteria is, is not success. Okay. Good, competence, faithful, loyalty. Right. So if God gave you 100 members, how many will go to heaven? If God gave me 2,000 members and only three go to heaven, and somebody had 10 members and 10 go to heaven, who, who, who was successful in the eyes mm, of God? Mm, mm. So we are very careful in using numbers as, as a measure of success, but numbers is important. Mm. Numbers also mean that you are winning more souls into the kingdom. You know, at God. church, some believe that church should be run as a business as well. You know, as much as you are trying to win the souls, you ought to have a body that will run the church. Where you have administration, you have a okay. church board, you know, so you don't lose the members. How you handle your church members is very, very important. Because if your human relation is not good, you lose members as well. Do you agree with this? Perfect. I, I don't wholly agree to say that run it like a business. Okay. I would rather say run it professionally because mm. business then you are, will connote profit. Okay. We don't do check to make profit. No. If, if there is excess um, after paying bills, praise the Lord. But the motive for doing church is never to make money. But mo most young pastors of late have a lot of money out of church. That's wrong. No, well... God in his own time will bless you financially and materially. So in the case of Eli, Elisha, um, Gehazi, who was his servant, mm -hmm. Naaman comes, he's healed, mm -hmm. gives him plenty of money, his boss declines, right. and then the protege, um, what is the name, um, Gehazi, runs after Elisha to collect those things. And when he was, <clears throat> he was confronted by his boss, his boss said, is it time to make money? It means that in the ministry, there is a time money will come. Mm. But don't go chase, don't make it your motive. So running the church professionally and administratively is important. Yes. Um, so for example, I did a, a, a degree in administration for University of Ghana Business School. Mm -hmm. So maybe that also helped me. Okay. Before we started Cedar Mountain Chapel, East Legon Assemblies of God, I made sure that, listen, we had opened a bank account because that the day after the first, I don't know who is coming on the first day, mm. and I can't collect the offering and send it to my house. So we opened the bank accounts, and I made sure that we had a, uh, those days, PO box, uh, what is it, is postal address. Box? Okay, postal okay, address. PO box. Uh -huh. Yes, I got two, three people. I put in place structures. So so before you start a church, you must, and if you belong to a uh, denomination already, mm. They make sure you follow the structures. Make sure there is accountability. Mm. When the church grows to a point you can employ an administrator, yes, mm -hmm. who takes care of, of the running of the office. And you, the pastor, must also develop soft skills. Because church is about human being. Human relation is key. Mm. Luke 2, 52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. If I'm favor with God and with men, knowing how to relate to people, it's, it's very, very important. Mm. Do you think some of the young churches have lost this focus? This is what some people are saying when you go on social media. People believe that the church is not how it's supposed to be. <clears throat> I don't know. Yes and no. Um, some, yes, indeed. They, some these days, the young guys, 
And also because of the com um, economic situation, mm. somebody goes to Lao Nipshia Mountain, gets a little anointing, comes to start a church. He has no clue about how churches run. He stayed in a church, uh, served as prayer warrior. He didn't even, wasn't patient to go through the ranks. Some have good motive, but they are clueless. Mm. So in the process, they make mistakes. But God is a God of patience. God is a God of patience. I'll tell people that don't rush into ministry. Um, submit and make sure that you are in a well-organized church. How it's many years important. must you submit? It will be difficult for me to legislate on that. But then, when it's time for you to go into it, your pastor should release you. People around you will be able to attest. Uh, I serve as, as associate pastor. I, my, my, my ministry history is very is unusual, it's interesting. Mm. I served as senior pastor of a church with three associate pastors. Then I resigned to, 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 to become a fourth associate pastor in another church. Why did you do that? Whereas people serve as associates and then they climb up, I went up and came down. Well, because um, I had to do that. I was helping this church then later on i had to get myself well integrated into my my mother church okay so i took it easy i came and humbled myself can you imagine a few days ago you were signing checks mm. you were chairing board mm -hmm. meeting suddenly you are now the fourth associate pastor and then you are saying yes sir and i thank god for that period of my life god used it to teach me loyalty to teach me more humility while serving as the fourth associate pastor then the Lord opened the door for me to become the director of administration of Assemblies of God headquarters. Right. You see how God works. Mm. From there, then I went to start Cedar Mountain Chapel, they going Assemblies of God, and then by the grace of God, now the general superintendent of the 91-year-old Assemblies of God with 600,000 members, over 6,000 churches, close to 4,000 pastors. That's how God works. When you are patient with God and allow God to take you to the meal, in his own time, mm. he makes all things beautiful. All things are definitely beautiful right mm. now. Uh, when you became the general superintendent, did you know? Did you feel you will become one? Yes, I knew it. Mm. God, God will never. God, God is a good God. He He reveal. He, God does take us by storm. Yes, He He gives inclinations. Right. Um, there's a dream I had when I was a teenager. I didn't understand until I was elected general student. And then I could not put the pieces together. Okay. I dreamt at the time that my photo was on the first page of our national calendar. Mm. I didn't really understand. And indeed, it does happen. Um, How old were you? Like 16? I think I'm 14, 16. 14, 16. And um, people saw it. I mean, growing, I mean, going through the ranks, people saw it. People mentioned it. And I served three general superintendents as administrator. Mm. God is a very intentional God. And so, yes, uh, I, we saw it coming. Let's talk about prophecies in churches. Mm. Uh, it's another dimension altogether because even when it was getting to 31st night, we had the IGP come talk about, you know, no doom prophecies. It's, it's beginning to look like Christianity is all about prophecies now. Uh, if you are not a prophetic person, some people look down on you. What do you think about prophecies in church and churches being built strictly on prophecies? Do you want my frank opinion? Yes, please. You may not like it. Please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in the fivefold ministry. Um, in the New Testament, we have the prophet, the apostle, the teacher, the evangelist. Which one have I left out? The pastor, the prophet, the teacher, the apostle, the evangelist. Now, the prophetic in the Old Testament mm. is different from the prophetic in the New Testament. That's why people don't get it. In the Old Testament, God's spirit was not in everybody. It came upon one person mm. who would then speak the mind of God. They didn't have, the word of God wasn't as common as this. It was on a scroll. Mm. How many, and a scroll, if you know what a scroll is, I mean, they couldn't, rep I mean, they, they couldn't reproduce it. So God's spirit comes upon one person and he speaks. Under the New Testament, Christ came to die to break the gap between God and man. Right. So when Christ died on the cross, that curtain, that divided us between us and God was broken. Mm. Now all of us have access to God. Right. 
Now God has put his spirit in on everybody. Once you get born again, surrender your life to Christ, his spirit is inside you. And God has put his message in the Bible. Mm. Everything God would ever say, God would want to say, even the future eschatology, the teachings on the end time, is in the Bible. So, the way the prophetic operates in the native is different. But someone to operate the prophetic like we are in the Old Testament. Mm. In the New Testament, we even have nine gifts. Some misconstrue word of knowledge for prophecy. You see, prophecy in the New Testament, prophecy is predictive. Mm -hmm. But in the New Testament, even preaching is prophecy. Wow. My members say it all the time. They say, Pastor, you are a prophet. I, I don't stand there and say, um, yes, once a while, when the need be, God gives me word of knowledge. But my member say that, Pastor, today's preaching, why were you in my office? You, Pastor, you were in my house. And I'm shocked. One lady, I was doing a very serious teaching three weeks mm -hmm. ago mm -hmm. on sexual purity. Then one lady said, and once a while, I like moving among the congregation. One lady said, Pastor, you came, you know, I'm... Hmm, I'm seeing somebody's husband. In, in fact, she couldn't tell me. She told another member. And I was struggling. Pastor came and stood directly in front of me. He was talking and pointing at me. I had no clue. Mm -hmm. Isn't that prophetic? Yeah. So, the word of God preaching is prophecy. Now, in the, in the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, we have word of knowledge is being given knowledge that others don't have. Mm -hmm. you have to see what others don't see. Then we have word of wisdom. Word of wisdom is where there is a complex situation, then God gives you an intuition and you're able to discern and pro 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 profess a solution. So under the New Testament, the prophetic, no. That's why the Bible says that we should judge prophecy. All of us have the Spirit of God. Mm. If you come and tell me that I will die, I have the right to challenge you. I, I must also go and pray. You cannot come and say, um, God says I should marry you. No. I must go and also have the Spirit of God. I have the ability to go to God and find out. So under the New Testament, you don't accept prophecy who like a sinker, the man of God says, I must go and sell my car. So mm -hmm. you won't listen to common sense. Mm. You won't listen to anybody. Mm. So um, I have a problem. And again, prophecy in the New Testament, the Bible says it must come to edify, to encourage. Prophecy shouldn't create confusion. Shouldn't create fear and panic. Any prophecy that creates fear and panic cannot be from God. Now, again, what is the motive for the prophecy? Every prophecy that yes. creates fear and panic it's cannot from be God. from God. I'm, I'm, I would dare anybody. Mm. 1 Corinthians 14, he says, prophecy must come to build, to encourage, to strengthen. Now, if, and again, there must be the application of wisdom and right. ethics in the delivery of prophecy. Now, can you imagine uh, the, some of these prophets who come and say, this person will die. Ask them, how would they feel if I come to their church in the presence of their wife and children? Can you imagine, my, look at my daughter and my yeah. son. And you come on radio and say that, I saw Pastor Wingham dead. Mm. Do you know the trauma you take my wife and children through? Right. Why are we not even, and, 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 and is God that reckless? So we are saying, even if God gives you a prophecy, apply common sense, mm. apply wisdom. You don't need to even come public. In the Old Testament, if you go and tell a king you will die, your head will go. Mm. King Nebuchadnezzar and others, you will dare not. Your head will go. Bible says, don't rebuke an elderly person openly. I, look, I see revelations. People dare my memories. I don't even tell them. You pray I for pray. them. Depend upon the person's level of faith. Yeah. So the way prophecy is handled is, 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 a, is, is problematic. Mm. And I think that uh, we, must, we must sanitize the system. Right. Uh, talking about sanitation of the system, I want you to know that my guest for today is Reverend Steve Wingham. He's the lead pastor for Cedar Mountain and he's also the general superintendent for uh, the whole Apostolic Church of Ghana. Assemblies of, Assemblies of, God. of God. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Assemblies of God Church of Ghana. Right. Let me go on uh, social media and read a few comments coming in. This one says, we are proud of you as a general secretary, uh, superintendent. You are the fire band of organization assemblies of god Ghana, reverend john wedungba i hope i got the name right yeah. um a man of wisdom indeed we are proud of you as a general gs of our 
sorry, our father, me and my wife are struggling with giving birth, but I'm encouraged by my GS. I think I'll be general superintendent one day because I have things in common with my GS. This is coming from Reverend Regan. All right, so more messages coming in. Good morning. Please ask the General Superintendent of Assemblies of God, why is it that Assemblies of God pastors struggle to feed their families? And why is it that their system is not centralized like Pentecost because their pastors are really struggling to make life? This is coming from Joseph. Rev, please answer this for me. Yes. Um, you see, comparing Assemblies of God to Pentecost is like comparing apples to oranges. Pentecost had a centralized system. Okay. So one pastor oversees many churches. Mm. We practice what the New Testament model of pastoring, where each local assembly has a pastor. That, that is a downside. Now, Pentecost, we have close to 4,000 pastors. Pentecost having got half of our number of pastors. Okay. So if you centralize, you worsen the, I mean, the situation for our pastors. So during my tenure, I've just, we just outdoored a vision paper, Christian, the transformation agenda. Mm -hmm. Now, under uh, the first thematic area, re, no, under the second, that is re, uh, rebuild, we are going to establish a special pastor's welfare fund and run missions fund, where we are going to raise resources to use that to cushion our pastors in the rural areas who are struggling. Okay. Uh -huh. So we cannot be like Pentecost. I mean, uh, we, 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 if we try it, our system will collapse. Mm, mm, it's mm. like the search of Ghana's economy. Okay. Until you correct the search of Ghana's economy, we are more import-driven. So you're going we to import fix more. Mm. So, uh, so the only way to correct our, our, our economy is to reduce import and export more. Right. So um, I want to assure the rank and file, we, we, are, we are where we are working towards, so they should be patient with us. We'll, we'll, be able, we'll gradually correct that imbalance in our system. Fantastic. More messages coming in. Please do not call my WhatsApp number. Uh, this pastor made my day. I really appreciate his presence in my life today. And I'm ready to dwell in his teachings for the days of my life. That's very thoughtful of him on your show, Sabina from Impoho. All right. So please, I want to ask the pastor, what's the difference between Old Testament and New Testament? Yeah, Old Testament um, has to do with at the time when God, people went to go through um, the prophets, the Old Testament was when man had sinned against God mm. and then man, man, man couldn't reach God. We had to appease God through the blood of animals. Under the New Testament, God has sent his son Jesus Christ to come and die and to pay the price. Mm. So the New Testament is where we have, we have direct fellowship. We are God's children. Right. And then... Um, Yes, like so the grace, the season okay. of grace, mm. where we get things from God, not because of merit. Grace means, um, grace means unmerited favor. Mm. So that's the clear, sorry, difference between. That's okay. You know, something that some pastors actually, some pastors preach is that um, the grace preachers, some of them, not all of them, claim um, because of the grace, even if you sin, you have made heaven. Um, I disagree with them. Grace is not a license to sin. So Paul said in Romans 6 that, that um, do you continue to sin because grace abounds? And because of grace, punishment for sin is severe at the end of the day. That's why God will throw you into hell. Right. So grace rather makes it easy to serve God. Those of us in the New Testament era, we are blessed. The Old Testament, yet they made it. Mm. So those of us in this era, you, you have no excuse if you should fail to make it to heaven. Right. All right. So this was a good morning, a nice conversation. Congratulations to him. We love him. Can you ask him whether they still take headquarters, levy 100 Ghana cities because some of us still pay? Gagai, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yes, every year we have a kind of uh, um, contribution that local churches make towards the vision of the church uh -huh, and the district also in the region. So I don't know the one he's talking about. Okay. Yeah. Yes, when we we're both at headquarters, we something like that came into the scene. But it's all to help us run and plant more churches and expand. Okay. That's Pastor made my day. I really appreciate his presence and my life today. Okay. I think I've already done this one. I'm grateful to God for how far he has brought Reverend Stephen Wingham. I knew him during my student days back in Wa, and he used to come for revival service at Revival Assemblies of God during when Reverend George Apasera 
was a head pastor and missions. I was privileged to be his interpreter during those days. He was a yeah. student at University of Ghana. I'm not surprised at all where God has elevated him to. This is coming from Yusif in Cape Coast. Oh, okay. Yes. I have a lot of messages coming in. I wish I could read all so many messages. Let me read one more, just one more, and then we continue the conversation. Reverend Dr. Wingham is a timely leader of Assemblies of God Ghana. We love him so much and his leadership style. Reverend Richard Opong AJ is coming through uh, with that one. Okay, on Facebook as well, this one is from Mac, and it says he's a wise man. Uh, another one says, I think from Abugri, says, I'm impressed by his response to the questions. And Mark also replies saying that you spend time with him and you will learn a lot. Isaac Atha says, my boss, GS, more grace, Reverend Dr. Sir. Kuma John said, we are proud of you, GS. You are just an amazing person to listen to. Ba Esther Impiwa says, a man of wisdom. I love you, Reverend. Very proud of you. Gladys Fancy says, God bless you, GS, and lead pastor. We pray for more grace, sir. All right. Now, this conversation, obviously, as a man of God, will definitely come up, whether we like it or not. It's all about mm. the National Cathedral. Your take on it. <laughs> um, well, I would say let's, let's tread cautiously. If you listen to the arguments for and those who think otherwise, uh, uh, both sides um, are, have the best of the nation at heart. So um, I would say that we need a middle ground. Mm. Which is? Yes, we need a middle ground where... We need to listen to both sides. Uh -huh. So I would say that let's tread cautiously. I mean, it's a beautiful idea. Uh -huh. But then let's look at the concerns. Listen to the concerns that are being raised. Because we need a buy-in from everybody to be able to get the project done. So I would say that let's tread cautiously. And then let's do it so that that which is done for God will, 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 will not be evil spoken of. It will also bring glory and honor honor to god mm. so with a contribution will you contribute since they are calling for uh, you know contributors oh why not i mean for me anything for god i mean my wife and i i turned 50 in september oh wow and uh, yeah and uh, i was praying and asking god what because i'm a product of grace having survived um, my, my siblings passed mm -hmm. my wife and i decided to build single-handedly we built a temple at gosso if I mention the figure to you, be amazed how God provided. So if <laughs> single-handedly we've been able to put up a temple in God, so anything for God, I am for it. Anything that will glorify God, that will aid in achieving the mission of the church. I mean, I will, so my personal contribution, I mean, why not? Okay. Now, Rev, we know we've spoken about church, 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 church. What do you do to relax? Apart from prayer, apart from, apart from reading the Bible, what else do you do for fun? Well, I love to watch movies, okay. um, um, local movies, especially African movies. Mm. Not every local movie. <laughs> some of the quality content of some of our local movies, <laughs> at least much to be desired. <laughs> and they are like to hang around mm. with, uh, I have a bit of a, uh, bit of me is sanguine. I'm a choleric sanguine. Okay. So I love to be among friends and crack all the jokes. Uh -huh. And then I love to be in the company of my girlfriend, my wife. You know, so I'm not too, I'm not an outdoor person. For example, when we travel outside, my wife loves to go on sightseeing. No, it stresses me. Oh. I can travel to a country and airport to hotel yeah. to the purpose of the distance and come back. That's me. So she does she does a sightseeing and the and, shopping for you. And she wants to <laughs> drag me along and for maybe for that alone I've not done too well. Maybe in twenty twenty three I probably have to look at that. <laughs> you, you definitely know? have to because I, I feel I have so much on my mind for lack of a better word, it's okay. I better not women get offended <laughs> When you trivialize things that mean a lot right. to them. Right. For you, it's, it's, it's important. But for, you know, for men, uh, and if you're not choleric, you, you are, you are task-oriented. Yeah. Uh, every other time, you want to focus on your vision and mm -hmm. your mission. Mm. Now, yeah. Also, watching the movies, do you like to listen to music? 
music very selective okay. music yeah especially worship um I'm a worshiper. I love, I love worship. So music, yes. Mm. Mm. Okay. And, and more messages on social media. Good morning, Daddy. We thank God for you as GS. Daddy, if you're a deacon and if the leading pastor is not involving you in the church, do you still have to follow him? This coming from, uh, said he didn't mention his name, but I think he's having a few problems. Well, I've not heard the full story, so I will not be able to pass judgment. But as a deacon, is supposed to be loyal to the God and the church and your pastor. Have a conversation with him and find out. Um, it's like a coach. The coach knows why he has kept somebody mm. on the bench. Mm. Uh, so find out. And then whatever he says, you he's the driver. He's the captain. So uh, let him do what he deems fit. Okay. And you, you give your best at any level. Mm. Okay, so this one is very interesting. I'm a member of AG, but why come pastors are finding it difficult to enter into their Bible college? Definitely. I mean, many are called, mm -hmm. but few are chosen. We are very careful in this era because of the economic situation. Everybody wants to be a pastor. Sometimes the motivation is, is, is not genuine, so we have to scream. And even now, to be frank with you, uh, we are going to streamline things and uh, slow down on the production of pastors. Uh -huh. We want to focus more on opening churches. Right. Opening more churches. Uh -huh. Winning more souls. Winning more souls. Mm. Um, we're not called to train more pastors. We're called to win more souls. So that is our priority. Mm. So um, if you are really called, um, and no matter how long it takes, I mean, I, I'm a member of the Greater Accra East Ministerial Committee. We screen until I became general superintendent, we screen people who, are, who want to go to the Bible school. I've had people who came three, three times. First time we said no, second time, the third time we passed them. So God's timing is it's the, the best. best. Mm. But sometimes it's discouraging, isn't it? It's, it's, so, so, so it's part of it, patience. Wow. I mean, if you claim you have been called by God and you don't have the spirit of endurance, long suffering, and patience, that alone should disqualify you. Then forget about it. Perfect. What's another message? Hello, madam. May I know why some of our pastors do not account on the church, uh, to the church on the use of funds? Why do uh, when you talk about it, they say you are questioning God? No, that is strange. In assembly, we are, if you want a church that is democratic and very accountable, it's assemblies of God. In our constitution, every pastor is supposed to have what we call business meeting where audited accounts is discussed you know so at various levels uh -huh. so um we may have to investigate that okay i mean it's it's it's, it's not our culture mm. you are supposed to be very even the, the as general superintendent we go for general council meeting every two years and according to the order of business we have the general superintendent's report the assistant the general secretary and then the treasurer's report where we discuss the audited accounts of the headquarters. When you go to the region, they do the same. From tomorrow, um, we are moving around the country. We're having our regional council meetings. They will discuss audited accounts. The district, the same. The local check, the same. So there should be something wrong somewhere. Right. Definitely will rectify. That's I'm my... looking at it. I'm like, yo, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> I think I should be about two. Wow. Two with my big stomach. My God, you haven't changed, you know. <laughs> But you have been a fashionista for a long time. Look at those shoes. Wow. And how old were you here? I'm guessing six? Six, yeah. Yeah. I think I'll credit my mother. My mother is a very neat person. Okay. Very, very neat. And she, she wants to make sure that you look good. <laughs> yes. You are looking so good. You see the hanging trousers. And, so and the shoes. All the fashion we are seeing today used to be. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, you have it. Yeah, you okay, see, you see, we used to call the political suit. It's back. And you were wearing political suit at I used to age. wear them a lot. Oh, at the time, I mean, almost, uh, yeah, at, that was what was invoked. And I rebelled. I remember, I don't know, I've forgotten at what age I told my mother, oh. I'll wear political suit again. <laughs> Look at the bar. <laughs> You were one fine gentleman, which you still are. Humble beginning. Yes, humble beginning. <laughs> who, who is that tailor? <laughs> In fact, they were wicked at the time. <laughs> oh, no, but this is nice, though. No, those are the tailors. I don't know why. The, the material could sew additional dresses. <laughs> <laughs> you are looking awesome. So, apart from gospel, do you listen to any other genre of music? No. Do you know Shatawale? I know, but I, I, I don't listen to that type of music. Because music is a spirit. 
and the spirit behind the music will control you. Mm. And I want only the spirit of God to control me. People listen to music and get infested with the spirit of lust, the spirit of fornication, even the spirit of corruption. Yes, listen to some of the lyrics of our songs. Don't just be excited about the tune. Are you saying some of the musicians take their songs to... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They won't tell you. Just as when a gospel musician, just as when Dinah Hamilton, mm. when you listen to that song, what happens to you? I don't know what, don't you feel moved? Mm -hmm. It's the spirit behind the song. So the same way, if the musician, I want to be sure which spirit you consult. So if you get to listen to any music and the, 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 the person is anointed by demons, you would think you're enjoying the music. That's why people go through problems sometimes. People have terrible dreams they don't understand. I'm not saying, please, I'm, I'm telling the public what the truth is. Mm. So therefore, I'm very careful. I always say, be careful what you hear and what you consume. But we, we have also heard some gospel musicians take their songs. Oh, yes. That's right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah. So, so, but then you see, um, once if the song is based on scripture, then you are safe. Mm. If the song is based on scripture, you are safer. Even if the person went somewhere, God's word is powerful. So, I want to caution people to be very careful. I'm very, very selective what I, what, what I consume. So, which one is your favorite gospel tune? You are finding problems. <laughs> what uh, is it? Let, let this cup pass away from me. Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. I want to sing with you. <laughs> no, there are. Okay, no, I have a lot of songs I love. Okay. Um, Don't sing song. Um, I, I am your worship. Um, I, I'm, I'm not too I'm good with music. And then um, Dan Hamilton's song. Um, his worship songs really move me mm, mm, to, mm, to 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 mm, to, to mm. love God and to want to give him my best. So which one will we sing today? Okay. Um this this morning when I woke up, this song was on my heart. Okay. And don't sing song. I am your worship. Uh, what, what is it? Receive the sleep the sacrifice. sacrifice. I am your worship. I have I'm more than a song today. Day. I brought myself. I am here. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, we go. you know how a lot of songs uh, you, you, you enjoy it, but when you start singing, you realize that when there's no choir back, and then you realize you don't know all the lyrics. We do it all the time. Yeah. We do it, we sing it, and we are dancing. Everybody knows that you know the song, but then when the choir stops, you're like, mm? yeah. Okay, so Reverend Steve Wingham, thank you so much for being well. here today. We are super, super grateful. Mm. Let's talk about the new year, 2023. Mm. What is supposed to be expected? What's God saying? God's word. Right. Um, for us in Assemblies of God, um, when I waited on the Lord and consulted my executive presbytery, we have declared 2023 as our year of holiness. 1 Peter 15, 16 says, God says, be holy because I'm holy. Mm. Joshua 3, 5 says that consecrate yourself today for tomorrow, the Lord will do wonders amongst you. God has wonders, miracles, breakthroughs, open heavens, strength testimonies installed, embedded in the womb of 2023. Mm. Holiness will unlock the place of God. The Lord was telling me that most of the time, the things we choose is about us. Mm. What we want from God. The Lord said, it is time to focus on me. He, God. So we've declared 2020 as a year of holiness. And as a result, I have declared National Week of Fasting and Praying okay. for all Assemblies of God churches, the maiden edition, starting from Monday 9th mm. to Sunday 15th of, of January. We are, all our churches are fasting and praying, morning, evening prayers. There'll be all night in all our churches on the 13th across the country. And then there'll be 24 hour nonstop prayer chain. The prayer chain, we have 24 administrative regions. So each region at a point will do, will do an hour okay. and then pass the baton on to the next region. So we're trusting God that within 24 hours, there'll be unbroken prayer going on around the country for the church, for our members, for 2023, for Ghana. We are really interceding for Ghana mm -hmm. and also for the body of Christ. And then my induction service is 
February 25th. Okay. We're now being inducted into office and the outdooring of my other executive members. And um, it will happen at the Grand Arena at uh, the Accra International Conference Centre. I have to be there. You have to be I there. I will be there. Or else next time you invite <laughs> me, I won't come. <laughs> I will send you a special invite. Thank you. And it's open to all our members, the general public. It's a historic event. But prior to that, the Thursday, Friday, 23rd, 24th, is the maiden edition of the Transformational Leaders Conference okay. for pastors and church leaders at Cedar Mountain Chapel, East Legon Assemblies of God. We have international speakers and some local speakers who are coming. Pastors, you can't afford to miss this life-changing conference. It will turn your ministry around and reposition you for global impact. I, I can't wait to be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is actually something that Ghanaians need, I must say. Mm -hmm. The prayers, it's mm -hmm. 24 hours chain prayers, interceding on our behalf. Mm -hmm. Meaning that when the recession comes, we might be able to jump over it. Yes, definitely. So, for example, we do 40 days. We start now 40 days fasting in our church. And I keep, one time, one lady said, Pastor, this 40 days we've been doing, eh? It's been thinking of a lot of things. So, and they are now beginning to appreciate because what we went through this last year, mm. and my members were testifying. I said, you see, those who took that fasting serious, people, people, the kind of testimony we recorded, even during the recession, was mind-boggling. Yeah. Bible says, when others say there is a casting down, you will say there is a lifting mm -hmm. up. So I want to urge Christians, don't joke with prayer in these times. You can't survive without prayer. Prayer will cushion you. Prayer will give you a comparative advantage. It will give you heads up. Prayer will open doors. So this is the time to pray to the new year. If you miss this early days and years, um, something else will control the year. Yeah. You have to you have to be a part of the prayers. Reverend, we are super grateful that you could make it. And it's we'll definitely honor. be there to support you. Thank you, um, um, Prime Morning Show, for this great honor. Um, Assemblies of God is grateful to you. All our people are watching all over the country. We place it on our platform. Um, thank you for this platform. God bless you're doing a great job. Thank keep you it so up much. and your crew here, everybody. Thank you. May God bless you. Amen. Favor you, Amen. keep you. This year, may God take this network to the highest level. Amen. May God favor you beyond Amen. your wildest dream. Amen. And most importantly, may the grace of holiness fall upon us. Amen. That as a nation, it shall be said that we shun evil and embrace righteousness. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. That was a powerful prayer that I was waiting for. Thank you. My guest for today has been Reverend Steve Wingham, and he's the General Superintendent for Assemblies of God Ghana, and also the lead pastor for Cedar Mountain Chapel, which is located at East Legon. So if you are looking for a church, look no further. Just go to East Legon. A very beautiful chapel, I will say. Beautiful. Is you there a number to there? I haven't been there. I will be you there. You need to enter. I will. If beautiful you think place. what is outside is beautiful, oh, enter. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sapoma yeah. uh, Adia. Sapoma is your friend. She's a very good friend. She says, thank you so much for everything oh, that you've Sapoma done for Oh, Sapoma and the husband, Oscar, yes. they are wonderful. Yes. Very loyal members. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of them. Yeah. And they say thank you. Glory to God. All right, so you've been watching the big interview, this big conversation. My guest has definitely started our year well. I mean, my year is definitely going to be a blessed one, and I know yours will be blessed as well. We have other conversations coming up, but make sure that you do join the big, big, big coronation. I'll call it coronation. Uh, 25th, February. 25th February. We will be there to support. Thank it's you. happening at the Grand Arena. My name is Rosalie Feli. We'll take a quick break. Coming up, other conversations to 